All right, ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages, it is time for a student of the gun radio. Don't you feel fortunate or don't you feel lucky? You say, you asked me that last week. Well, yeah, it still applies. <laughs> it still applies to today. Don't you feel fortunate? You should feel fortunate. What are we going to talk about? I'm searching right now, actually, I'm searching for, did you guys see the story about how the the brave and courageous uh people at the uh customs and immigration or what they uh maybe, i don't know if it's customs and immigration who, who is it that uh, that is controlled controls the ports uh how they the seized a load of uh i don't know no not port authority but they seized a load of uh airsoft guns and and they they got them off the streets in America or in like Britain? In America? Oh, in America! In America, you know why? Tell me because why. They well, they didn't because they didn't have orange tips on them. Oh, was they were they filled with drugs or something? No, no, they were they were just they were toys. They were airsoft toys, and but they were they were seized by the brave, fearless, and courageous men and women of the U.S. federal government. They seized those toys. A hundred more than a hundred airsoft rifles seized by federal authorities in Louisville. In Louisville, yeah. Cornette will be proud. Yeah, drop that into the uh, the Duracoat thing. So, uh, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about colors. We're going to talk about knives. You guys want to talk about assisted opening knives? Sure, you do. Uh, combat accuracy. What is realistic, and should we rely on statistics? Yes, should we rely upon statistics? Uh, how many times have you heard the average, right? You hear the average, the average this, the average that. Yes. We're not here to be average. That's right. I'm not here to be average. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and shut my mouth so Zach can play the intro music and we can jump right into this with both feet. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here we don't just talk about guns and gear, we also discuss current events and politics. Because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drip ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co-hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Martin, and the shipping ogre, Zach Martin. Now, give it up for your beloved host, the Pimp Hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. All righty, ready to do that's Yes, indeed, it is us, it is I, and this is what we're going to do. And aren't you excited? All right, so uh, step number one. Uh, do you want to talk about the uh, rape of the mind first, or do you want to go ahead do the uh, the quote of the week first, the review of the week? Let's start with the rape of the mind. Okay, so uh, we've been recommending this book for about a month or so now. It's called The Rape of the Mind by Eust Mirlu. And uh, Eust Mirlu, uh, is, he's not with us anymore, but he was a psychologist, a clinical psychologist, psychiatrist. And he wrote a book, uh, and he discussed uh, brain. First, he started out by uh, talking about individual submission. How do you brainwash? How do you get an individual person to essentially be brainwashed to, to uh, commit menticide against them? And then he moves on from there. And he talks about how do you do that, the same thing, to an entire society? How do you do it to a group of people? And he talks, one of the chapters, he, he, he gives an example of a, a, uh, a notional nation, and he calls the notional nation, he calls it totalitaria. Uh, and he talks about the people of totalitaria and the rulers of totalitaria. Um, and I was reading it yesterday, and, I was in, it, ladies and gentlemen, you have to read this book. Uh, get, you know, go to uh, Amazon and, and see where this book is right now, if you will. So, But on page 122, let me see, 122, starting on page 121, it says, uh, it says the need to, uh, to, to find conspiracies to discover persecutors and criminals is another schizophrenic manifestation. Uh, it is psychologically related to an infantile need to, for a feeling of omnipotence. Megalomaniac feelings grow better in an atmosphere of mysterious secrecy. 
And it says number one bestseller in communism and socialism. Yep. And secrecy and conspiracy increase the delusion of power. That is why so many people like to pry into other people's lives and play the spy. And I saw that and it says, that is why so many people like to pry into others' lives. Like to pry into others' lives. What have we said here? What have we been talking about literally for years and years and years? You know, we on our side, there's one side of the equation in the world or in the United States of America that just wants to be left alone, right? And then there's the other side that literally, realistically, they cannot leave you alone. People say, well, you know, what's the difference between liberalism and conservatism? And, you know, there's no difference between Democrats and Republicans. They're the they're the they're different sides of the same coin and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, and that actually that's explained in there, too. That's apathy. Uh, that's that's just giving up. It's like, well, there's there's no hope. So just give up. There is hope, but you need to understand and if you've ever wondered why why do HOAs exist? Oh, HOAs exist because though there's so many oh my lord, there's so many reasons that I could get into for HOAs and and the evil of HOAs. Uh, I can't believe that in the United States of America that we actually allow that to occur because it let's face facts, the HOA violates the the Bill of Rights. It violates the Fourth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment. No, it doesn't. But if it doesn't, go get the Fourth Fourth Amendment. Go get your your pocket constitution and read it. Oh, the idea that a commission or a committee of fellow citizens who are supposed to be on the same level as you can get together and vote and tell you what you can at, can and cannot do with your own property is a complete and total violation of the Constitution of the United States. I can't believe that, that an attorney hasn't slam dunked that yet. Uh, like, no, but it's for the betterment of all. Oh, you mean like communism? Now, so th there is a story that I'm going to go into vague detail about that a friend of mine has been going through. Where, like, you think HOAs are just annoying little, you know, freaking neo-Nazis who like to act like middle managers. No, they're a real threat. Because there's someone I know who uh, stopped paying their HOA fees mm -hmm. because the HOA wasn't doing what they were supposed to Like, they weren't doing snow removal and stuff, you know, the stuff that you're supposed to pay the fees for. Right. And uh, so the HOA sold their house out from underneath them. Squeeze me. Baking yep. powder. In the bylaws of the community they lived in, if they violated HOA and did not pay, that they could resell the house and evict you. That that cannot possibly be legal. There's no possible way. They, they've right? been trying they, to fight it, but uh, it would appear, unless they want to like go ha hire Cochran and Cochran and go to court. Well, that, that's the thing. Oh, you're you're gonna get me all fired up in this I mean, uh, part of the show. It, so. But, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to understand the, the minds of, of the liberal, the minds of the woke, the minds of the tyrant, if you want to understand, you see, that's understanding is where you start, is where you begin. And we've talked about this. Uh, you're like, you always say that, Paul. I'm like, well, yeah, it's true, though. Uh, it's, it's true. We've literally been, we've been ringing this bell for a long time. That you can't fight an enemy if you don't know who your enemy is. See, that's fifth generation warfare. Uh, I just saw a clip recently uh, with Dr. Robert Malone, and he explains how we're currently in a situation that he calls fifth generation warfare, because the people who are being attacked and abused don't know really who is attacking and abusing them. You see, because the actual enemy is putting out their straw men. They put out straw men for you to attack, uh, like, like Biden. Biden is, B Biden is evil. And he's a criminal uh, and he's mentally incompetent and the people around him are criminals, but he's not the one calling the shots. He's not the one who released the, the COVID vax, the COVID um, uh, virus Shot. on the world. 
he's not the one who released that on the world. He, he's not the one who organized the mass pandemic. They're, you know, they're not the ones that had all the poison shots ready to go miraculously, like within a couple months, which has never happened in the history of the world. Never in the history of the world has a virus appeared from nowhere. We're like, what? What is this? Where did this come from? We have no idea what this is. Like, oh, let's let's go to the lab and come up with a solution. Two months later, hey, we got we have solution. What? Never in the history of the world has that ever occurred. Uh, that's because we're so super smart right now. Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, but my point is this. You need to understand the minds of the of the people who are trying to enslave you. You need to understand the methodology of those who are trying to control you. Gun control, gun is 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 only the precursor. It's the small word. Control is the word. Gun control is meant to control you, your mind and your body, how you live your life. Dude, that's that's the beauty of a firearm. That's the beauty of a rifle. A rifle is meant to be. Ladies and gentlemen, why do you think that that other side, that the that the state, why do you think that Joe Biden's puppet masters keep sending him out to derp a derp AR fifteen, derp a derp assault rifles, derp a derp gonna ban them? No, you're not. Uh, but why do you think they keep doing that? Why do you think they keep doing that? Because the A, I mean, the AR-15 is the number one most prevalent rifle in the United States of America, hands down. There's no question about it. So if it is the, if it is the in common use, see, that's one of the the tricky things that they try and they they try and uh, use uh, to. What do you call it? Uh, To deceive us. They try and deceive us by saying, oh, well, the government's allowed to take away blah, 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 if it's not in common use. But if it's in common use, they're not allowed to, which is the exact opposite of liberty. In in the Bill of Rights, it doesn't say, well, as long as as the majority of people agree, then you can do that. But if the majority of the people don't agree, then you no longer have liberty. You no longer have freedom. But I would get back to the AR-15. The AR-15 is the most prevalent firearm in the United States of America. The number one. It's the it's in common use, right? So if that's the case, then why is it that the state is so hell bent on trying to get them out of your hands. It's really not a hard question. It's not a, it's not a difficult question because a rifle in the hands of a citizen is an instrument of liberty. And when you are the state and your goal is to control the people from cradle to grave, you cannot abide by them possessing an instrument of liberty. You can't abide by that. It, it has to go. There's an impediment between the state having total control over you, and and that is the that's the AR-15. That's the instrument of liberty. That's what keeps them from having total control over you. That's what our founders knew and understood. So you have to understand the mind of your enemy. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, I know a lot of you guys have. We, we drove this book. I, Jared, you think it's safe to say that we drove this book to number one? Because when, yeah, I, it when, I, before. when I bought this, it was like number 318 in psycho, psychological sciences or whatever, or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, we started recommending this book, and, and it jumped to number one in its category. And, and the book's been out since 1958 or 56. 56. Get this book. The great thing about this versus the political thought of the American Revolution is this is still available in on-demand printing. So uh, you need to get that book. You need to read it. And uh, in your eyes will be open. The scales will fall off your eyes. And you'll realize, because most of your life, you probably realize, or maybe not most of your life, but at least 
recent in recent years, you're like, these people are messed up. Why are they messed up though? Or you might be thinking, I know this is wrong in my guts. I know this is bad. I know this is wrong, but I can't, I can't explain it. Read the book. It'll be explained to you. All right. Uh, Q's and A's. If you're live in the discord and you've got some Q's, we've got some A's for you. So, but in addition to that, Jared has a review of the week. And uh, it comes from Podbean. The bean of pods. <clears throat> it's from Papa Smurf on Podbean. He says, we went to, so this is a sort of a review, sort of a story here. I think it's interesting. He says, we went to Silver Dollar City for family vacation in 2019, and I had a backpack. In my backpack, I had three extra tourniquets and a couple of pocket lifesavers. The guy checking the bag at the gate questioned me for almost five minutes. I also had some water and snacks for my kids. He asked me why I had them and where is my gun? Like, I don't have a gun. And he says, I did concealed. Uh, however, I have these because you never know when you might need it. He finally allowed me through with all of my stuff. And uh, the reason that I chose this is because it's a good example of um, what we were just talking about. <laughs> it's like, if you have to wonder why somebody needs medical equipment, then you're probably one of those priors into other people's lives. Yeah, or your your mind is the the mindset of that person is that's not your job. That's the state's job. If it well if you if you you're not allowed to save yourself. You have to ask permission to be saved. You have to get on your phone and you have to call someone and have them come save you. You can't save yourself. You're not allowed. Oh, we just the the uh if you guys haven't seen lately, we, we discovered a, a, a new product that we thought was really uh, important at, Sh at SHOT Show this year. And it's a company called Lifesaver, and they make water purification kits. And so we got some and put them on our store. And uh, I went out and shot some videos of me actually using them. I've been waiting for the snow to go away and for the rivers to get up because I thought it would be picturesque for me to review it down by the river. And, well, anyway, I finally got around to doing that, and that's what I did. So I, I posted a little photograph from the, you know, a still shot from the video, and I tagged our store, our student of the gun store, in there, and they initially, they, they flagged the, the, uh, the Wayfarer kit, and it says, violates our standards, has been blocked. Like, so a water purification kit violates Facebook's standards. Why did their algorithm immediately block that? You say probably because it was on our store. Well, here's the no, here's the crazy thing. I, I put both the jerry can, the jerry can is a five gallon water can that has all this, you know, uh, the yeah. filter and everything built in it. And then the Wayfair is a backpack one, right? So it allowed the jerry can one to post. Mm, interesting. But, you know, so I couldn't figure I that out. I try not well, to understand the algorithm and these things because it's always confusing to me. Well, and so you have to, but how, you have to ask yourself who and well, like which programmer told the algorithm that if you encounter something like that, don't let it go. Block it. Stop it. Yeah. And the only thing I could think is, well, because that's, you know, being able to filter and purify your own water without asking permission from the state or without going to a state commission or a county commission or whatever, uh, that, that leads to independence and self-reliance and resilience. And that's bad. That's bad. You need to be part of the system. Anyway, uh, so thank you very much, Papa Smurf, for sharing that. And... Uh, yeah, I've, I've actually, I don't fly anymore, but when I used to fly a lot, I would take the pocket lifesavers and the med kits on and off the planes with me all the time. And I I've never, never had, had any issues yet. Yeah, I never had any issues. The issue I had was with, with you know, various different styles of tactical pens. 
you know, aluminum pens. I had a titanium yeah. one uh, where they would pull it out and they would flip it over and look at it and hold it up to the light and disassemble it and pull the ink refill out and stuff. Do like a chimpanzee examining a wristwatch, you know. So there you go. All right, let's talk about colors. You guys want to talk about colors? Let's talk about colors. It's time for a Duraco Finish Firearm segment of the week. All right, colors are fun. I like colors. You like colors. We all like colors. And uh, we've addressed this, and we, we, for, I'm about to do it again. But for quite a while, we've been addressing the issue that it is intention and behavior that you should be focusing on, not color. Uh, the idea that certain colors are, oh, I don't know, bad or certain colors are bad and certain colors are good. And, you know, but like it's it's crazy. It's it's meant aside. It's freaking schizophrenic. It's psycho talk. You guys, you guys recall when we did the uh, the red, the all red fire extinguisher shotgun? Probably yeah, people lost their crap. People either it was there That's was a, a minority group, but it was still people. Yeah, it, people either absolutely loved it or they hated it so vociferously that they couldn't stand themselves. They were like on the ground seizing. Uh, but I thought that that bright colors meant okay or meant good or meant safe, you know, whatever. Uh, we got a story here, and this is the the brave and fearless, courageous members of Customs and Border Patrol. Yes, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol confiscated. I like how in this story they put the word rifles. Come on, WHAS11 on your side. It even says on your side. Yes. So first of all, all right. So the 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 title of the, the oh oh okay. So in the title it says more than one hundred airsoft rifles seized by federal authorities. But in the opening paragraph it says, what does it say, Jared? It says. Federal authorities say that they according have to no no oh, no right 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 below it according to U.S. Customs yeah subtitle there you go. according to U.S. Customs and Border Protection officers confiscated the rifles during the Operation Safety Tip from March twentieth to March twenty fourth uh, Dateline Louisville Kentucky April seventeenth twenty twenty three. Federal authorities say that they have seized 100 airsoft toy rifles in Louisville. Wow. According to U.S. Customs and Border Protection, officers confiscated the rifles during their Operation Safety Tip. Officers focused on suspect shipments of the toys without orange safety tips that were attempting to enter, oh, attempting entry into the U.S. It focused on merchandise exported from China and Hong Kong and also merchandise that was described as airsoft replica toys and other cargo. Wow. Let's go ahead and pu put a pin in that for a second. So the, now we've, we've talked about this. We talked about how there's only so many hours in the day and there's so much money in the budget and there are only so many resources, right? Resources are finite. So, uh, not for the government. Yeah, no, well, the, the, even for the government, you have humans. I mean, humans only have so many hours. There's still only 24 hours in a day, right? You just throw more seven days in a week. Oh. So if you type in the word fentanyl crisis, uh, according to the, the governor of California, he has released a master plan for tackling the fentanyl crisis. He said over 71,000 Americans died in uh, 2022 from fentanyl overdoses, right? How many people died in 2022? We don't have 2023 stats yet. In 2022 from orange tip airsoft gun assaults, 
or non-orange tipped airsoft gun assaults. Uh, well, what are you talking about? That's a stupid question. So we have, if you listen to politicians, if you listen to the governor of California, we got a story from the governor of Iowa. There's a story from, uh, well, Biden Harris designate talk about overdoses, fentanyl, uh, black Americans, the pandemic spike in fentanyl overdoses from 2023, May 2023. So we have now riddle me this Batman is fentanyl that the fentanyl that's causing this opioid disorder and all of these overdoses, is it coming into the country legally or illegally? You know, most fentanyl overdoses is not straight fentanyl. You guys understand that, right? It's fentanyl mixed in cocaine or fentanyl mixed in methamphetamine or fentanyl mixed in this or that. Um, why isn't U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, instead of spending, I don't I can't even imagine how much money these imbeciles spent for Operation Safety Tip. Why don't you do an operation, stop the flow of illegal immigrants, of illegal invaders into the United States? How about you do an operation, stop the flow of fentanyl into the United States? Because, you know, when these tens of thousands and millions of illegal invaders come into the country. A lot of them are drug runners. What? No, that's not true. That's not true. They're not felons that were emptied out of Central American and South American prisons. No, that's not true. We have, all right, look up, if you want to look up Darien... Gap buses. So we have actual, we have footage now where migrants, illegal invaders, are being loaded up on buses. These are people who have no, who are not entering the country legally. They're being loaded up on buses. May, March 9th at Darien Gap. Uh, as Darien arrival grows, Panama migrants move north. Our friend, our mutual friend, uh, Michael Yan, has been down there. He's ac he's actually uh, taken video of illegal invaders being loaded onto buses. I figured and, out what they're doing and shipped to the the border. Well, that's what we think, but this story says. 30 year old migrants who survived the Daring Gap were killed in a bus crash in Costa Rica. Okay. So there you go. It's free bus rides. Free bus rides. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, where's Customs and Border Patrol on the tens and hundreds of thousands of illegals? And these aren't just from Mexico, they're from all countries. There's Chinese. How, how and why would Chinese, quote, immigrants become trying to come into the United States from Central America through Mexico? Does that make any sense at all? Wouldn't, they, wouldn't it make more sense for them to come in through San Francisco or San Diego or Seattle? Why, if you were a legal Chinese immigrant, if you were up and up, straight up, not a criminal, you you're just want a better life for yourself, why wouldn't you apply for you know, uh, a temporary visa and come through a port of entry like San Francisco or Seattle, San Diego? Why would you go to Panama through the jungle and get on a bus to travel all the way up, you guys know you know what a map of Central America looks like, to the Texas border or the Arizona border to cross illegally. We have very, very real problems with illegal invasion and drug trafficking. And yet here we have the brave, bold, courageous men and women of the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol seizing 
airsoft guns because they didn't have an orange tip. Really? Really? That's your priority? This is this is the you know uh who which what movie or show is oh is it Doctor Evil? So this is how you like to want to live your life. Yeah. Okay. Reach I'm reaching for the button. Oh, that's how you want to live your life. So that's how you want to live your life. So uh if I put an orange muzzle brake on my AR fifteen, that makes it okay, right? Yes. So I can walk around town with my AR fifteen. Uh, and I can I can walk around, point it at people, point it at cops. And as long as it has an orange muzzle brake on it, I'm good to go, right? Right? No. no. What do you What do you mean? What? No. What are you talking about? Well, why not? Because the 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 color automatically makes it safe. And if it doesn't have that color, it's automatically not safe. And what is that anyway? You see, what we've gotten away from is this this whole thing right here is psychotown. This entire story is psychotown. The idea that the color somehow makes it safe, not the behavior. They're like, yeah, or or children, children are getting shot and killed by police officers because their airsoft guns don't have orange tips. Really? Well, number one, who's raising children to point airsoft guns at police officers? Um, and which police officer sees a bunch of 12-year-olds playing in an empty lot with things that look like guns and decides, I'm going to go smoke those kids. I'm going to go over there and kill them. What? When I was a kid, we we ran all around our neighborhood with toy guns all the time. We had the little toy M16s, we had the little toy Tommy guns. We had, you know, the little toy pistols, cap guns, they were silver and black and none of them had orange tips. And you know, not one time can I re remember ever as a child directly encountering a police officer unless maybe my parents were there or something like that and you know what none of the parents in my neighborhood when we little nine-year-olds and ten-year-olds when we were running around we called it playing army when we were playing army you know when we were running around our you know jumping over fences and climbing up stuff and, and laying beside the house and waiting to ambush our buddies with our little toy guns when they came around none of the neighbors felt the need to to call the police and i have to imagine that back then if if they would have called the police and said there's kids playing with toy guns in their yard the the dispatcher had been like and then how about you go find better hobbies there, Gladys? You say, well, that was then. This is now. Things are different. Yeah, why are things different? Why are things different now? Why, why do you have Kyles and Karens calling 911 because the neighbor kids are playing airsoft in the backyard? Why are police responding to kids playing? It's not about colors. It's about behavior. And the idea that, that because a kid has an airsoft toy, it's a toy that doesn't have an orange tip that the cops are just going to run up and smoke them. That's what you want in your law enforcement. You want law enforcement officers that don't have an ability to think. You don't have time. You don't understand, Paul. You don't know what it's like to be a police officer. Oh, that's right. I don't know what it's like to be a police officer. Did you hear that? That was that one imbecile out in the audience who said that. Mm. It just showed up yesterday and doesn't know any, uh, what they're talking about. All right. There you go. Colors are fun. And real, real quick, I have what? one last thing I want to I want to cap this all off with. It, it has nothing to do with the actual story. Uh, 
what does the what what's the title of the story again? More than a hundred air rifles seized by federal authorities. Mm-hmm. So I before E every day as I get older becomes more and more BS. I before E except after no. C. Where's the C in seized? No, it's it's there's there's different rules. Yeah, no, learn the, the rules. Learn your rules. I it's not supposed e, except the English C, language except is not supposed to be easy and it's not supposed to be convenient. Yeah, but th- you're supposed old, to have to think. That old adage that they gave us is complete horse honky. Well, it's it's not. There are dozens and dozens of EI words that don't have a C in them. Okay. There's a coffee cup you can buy that says I before E except after C except, and then it lists like twelve words. Well, you need to get that coffee cup and, I will. and use yeah. it as as to to help you memorize. Didn't you that's, know that's, the word seized begins with a C, Zach? Yeah. Hardy, 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 hard. I just wanted to point that out real quick because that's always bothering. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> so you know. If you were to get a high point, um, what 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 are the what are the uh, the the carbines? If you were to get a new high point thirty ninety five, uh, that is the the thirty super. Thanks for asking. Yeah, if you were to get one of those, well, uh, and you want it to be extra safe, all you'd have to do is uh, paint the muzzle brake. Uh, orange and and it'll be safe it'll be super safe no one will be hurt you can walk around your neighbor you can yeah, give it to a meltdown you give it to a 12 year old and uh and have them walk around the neighborhood with it because it has an orange tip that means it's okay i've been threatening that you you <laughs> how many of you are gun people okay put your hands back down uh, how many of you have added suppressor adapters uh, to your rifles. And in order to do that, you had to remove the standard birdcage uh, muzzle brake slash compensator slash whatever. Yeah, I just took a sawzall and cut the end of the barrel (laughs) off and and re-threaded it. (laughs) So I have, I'm I'm the guy that has a box full of old A2 uh, flash hiders slash. They're all different colors, huh? Well, no, there's like three or four of them that, oh. are, that are orange. I, I it's that that uh, last year or two years ago, whatever. I get that during uh, Halloween time, they were selling the pumpkin orange spray paint at the hardware store. It was on sale, so yeah. I got it. And I, I, I'm, I've been threatening to put those on a real gun, and people are like, "Oh, you better not do that. You'll go to jail." I'm oh like, my gosh! I like yeah, it's, where where are we in the world right now? Where you think you can go to jail over a color? Yeah, really, really. Where where are we? What's it's like the like the the uh, fire extinguisher gun? Like you're going to jail? Like what? You think I'm going to be arrested, put on trial, and imprisoned? For having a shotgun that is red. Technically, they never said you would be going to prison. They said you were going to go to jail. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. there you go. But anyway, if you if you want to have some fun, you just get yourself a high point carbine and uh, add an orange muzzle brake uh, flash hider to the front of it, and it'll be perfectly safe. And, and everyone, you know, if, if that's the case, then we should make everything orange. That is one of those things that, uh, like, just growing up and having air, like, as a kid, you all airsoft guns have orange tips, or at least for me, they did. And uh, mm. it's just one of those things where it's like, it just feels wrong because it's, you did something some way, one way for so long. And then changing that is all, it's like a habit, right? Meant to side. Yeah. yeah. It's meant to side, but it, it's like it ended up the people that are freaking out about the, Oh, you can't put an orange chip on a real gun. Like, stop treating guns as if they're not real guns. And it doesn't matter what color the tip is. But it's like the people like, Oh yeah, you idiots out there painting your guns, different colors and making them camouflage. And, and then they look like toys. And then that's terrible. And 
Wow, you are the stupidest human on planet Earth. Uh, it's what you got it when you guys read that book. Now, I understand that some of you don't have the mental capacity, and it's okay. It's okay. You need to stay close to your to your your elders and your parents, and they'll take care of you. But for the rest of you out there who have the mental capacity to understand the English language, uh, yeah, it, it's it is the equivalent of putting on the they live glasses. It, it is. It's like if you don't know what that is. Well, I don't know. I don't know how, know how to help you. But uh, yeah, it's like it's like putting on the they live glasses, the glasses from they live, and you see, you you realize the the lies and and the deception that goes on around you every single day, and and it's not just see we like to say well you know everyone has their this goes back to everyone has their own opinion and everyone's opinion is valid. And blah, 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 blah. No, no, everyone's opinion is not valid. Some people's opinions are stupid. Some people's opinions are based on lies and deception. And I don't have to automatically believe it or endorse it or agree with it. I'm not going to agree with you just because you think it's the nice thing to do. Oh, video attention, new listeners. So this is when I shut up. And I let the listeners listen. Attention, new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. All right, did you do that? Did you go to studentofthegun.com? Did you go to SOTG? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Do that. Everything SOTG. Studentofthegun.com. That's where we put up the new articles. And you can go directly to the shop. And you can watch videos and all of that good stuff. So do that. All right. We got a Brownells bullet points for you. And during our Brownells bullet points, we usually talk about stuff, right? We talk about hardware. We talk about physical things that you can hold in your hand. And, uh, well, today's not going to, it's going to be no different. All right. So last week, uh, we were reminded by our friends at Brownells that May is Stop the Bleed Month. We talked about that. We talked about how Brownells in their emergency and survival gear actually has in stock. They have traumatic medical gear and traumatic medical gear pouches and uh, so on and so forth. Well, uh, I had to. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and admit something to you. I've got a little mini pouch. Oh, uh, what is it? What are those pouches? The 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 ones that Ready Man sold or sells the. They're about what eight inches by six inches by four inches deep. Well, the one of the little tiny Velcro belt pouches. No, not the not the belt ones. The the mid size ones. Does it have a zipper well, on it? Yeah, the, it has two it has dual zippers. It's the one that yeah, I have the, in my. It's the blowout it, bag available on shopsotg.com. Okay, that's one I have in the truck. So, in addition to having to construct a mandate for myself uh, uh i cut my thumb in a stupid way and i don't even want to talk about it uh but i was at the range and i've got this awesome blowout kit and it's got chest seals and pressure dressings and gauze and nose hoses and decomp needles and tourniquets but what i needed was a good band-aid <laughs> and what i didn't have was a good band-aid uh-huh. So uh, I was like, okay, well, that's, that's cool. You know, I may do, um, but I did have duct tape. And so I just, you, and I had, I had loose gauze. And so I took the gauze and the duct tape and I made a bandage out of it. Cool. Cool story, bro. Well, recently 
uh, I had a battle box. I got a battle box. And in the battle box was a, a really nice looking comp, a fold, a folding knife, a pocket knife. And I thought, well, that's a nice looking pocket knife and it has a belt clip on it or a pocket clip, you know, and it's assisted opener. And why don't I carry that? Why don't I start carrying that? Why not? I don't know. Why not? So I put that in my jeans pocket and, uh, going about my business. And two days later, I'm at the gym. And believe it or not, I take my pants off when I go to the gym and I put shorts on. So I went to the gym and I changed into my workout clothes and then I finished and I went to change back into my regular clothes and I went, I reached into the pocket and I felt like something bit me. Mm. I was like, ow, something did bite you. And I, I like yanked my hand out and on the back of my hand is a freaking gouge. And it immediately starts bleeding. So I run over and I get a paper towel because I'm standing in the, the men's locker room. So I run over and I get a paper towel and I put it on it and I hold it against it tightly. And daily then, and nightly? Yeah, daily and nightly. Then uh, So I go to the pocket and I pulled it out and I realized that the assisted opener, well, sometimes assisted opener pocket knives assist too much right? Sometimes they assist a little too much, a little too wrath. And what had happened was the little, the little humpy bumpy thing that's on the blade that you flicked to, you know, open it. Uh, well, apparently it got bumped inadvertently or touched or whatever. Yeah, when you like and, folded them up or whatever. And so the, the blade was sticking out from the, the body about an inch. And that really super sharp point when I reached in my pocket, it jammed right into the back of my hand. It was a fun time. Yeah. So, and I actually had a, a, a friend of mine back when, uh, and I know this specifically because I remember the story, when this is, is going to date me or date him or whatever, when Emerson Knives came out with the wave technology, uh, they called it the wave, and it was a way to open your um, folding knife as you pull the knife out of your pocket. You'd, you'd grasp it and pull it out, and you would catch the wave on the corner of your pocket. And, you know, they did videos, and it looked so cool and sexy, and, man, you look like a, a super badass when you do that, and blah, blah, blah. So a friend of mine who was a cop got an Emerson you know, uh, folding pocket knife with the wave thing, whatever. And he reached his hand into his pocket and it had come open and it caught him right in the palm and he ended up with like 15 stitches in the Ooh. palm of his hand. Ouchie. Yeah. So my, my advice to you guys is this. If you've got one of these, and they're really cool and, and they're super handy and you should... I'm not telling you that you shouldn't have a pocket knife that opens one handed. As a matter of fact, the idea in our modern world that you would have a pocket knife that you can't open one handed is kind of crazy and archaic. You're like, uh, duh, of course, every knife in the world, unless it's uh, like grandpa's old timey knife, you can open a folding knife one handed. And that's a good thing. But you got to be careful. Some of these assisted openers assist a little too much. Somebody and, was telling me a story, and I don't remember if you were there or you remember who this is, but they were telling me a story about how they had wrecked their car or something, and one of their hands was pinned, and they couldn't open the knife with two hands, but they had one of the spider coat knives that I have. It had the hole so they could... And that was back when they, it was a brand new concept. Mm -hmm. Do you remember who that was? No. Somebody was oh, telling I, me that I story. think I would have remembered that story. Yeah. Yeah, man, I don't remember who it was, but I was like, wow. Because I, I cannot conceptualize a time when there wasn't the ability to open a knife with one hand. It's no, always Spider, been that way. Spiderco turned the world on its ear with the Delica. By, by creating a knife that had a pocket clip, so it wasn't you didn't need a sheath, 
So you no longer needed a belt sheath or anything for your knife. And it, you didn't have to fish it out of the bottom of your pocket uh, by putting a belt clip or a pocket clip and putting the hole in the blade so you can open it with your thumb. They, they changed the world. They really did. And they actually changed the world by using a, a, what they called a Zytel or a, a high-strength polymer for the body. So it made the, the blade even lighter. Uh, but I tell you what, so that that's something you need to be aware of, especially if it's new. If you've never carried it, uh, that happens. I'll tell you, and, and you just whipped it out. I'll tell you what, where I've been carrying for 20, 30 years. I've, I got my first Delica in 1993. Really? Yes, I got my first Delica, Spyderco Delica in 1993. So I've been carrying Spydercos for 30 years. And this is a bird knife. This is a Spyderco bird. It's their, um, these are the ones that they, that they make in Taiwan or China or something like that. But uh, they're really good knives, but they're, they're less expensive because the. That's my knife. I wondered where that went. F you. It's not your knife. <laughs> so, um, the answer, though, is in 30 years, I've never had a Spyderco knife negligent discharge in my, in my pocket. And that's what I get. I should, that's what I get. If I was talking to the guys at Spyderco, they'd be like, you should have never put that other knife from that other company in your pocket. Should have known better. I should have. You know, and it's pretty, and it's, it's slick, and it looks cool, and it also bit me. And so what I ended up, and this is, there's the, there's the blood. So how did you fix yourself, Paul? Well, um, there's a Walgreen about a quarter of a mile away from the gym. So I drove straight to the Walgreens, went in, bought the generic package of super glue. <laughs> and I super glued the cut on the back of my hand. And I also bought one of those little Band-Aid um, travel packs. The, the pl it has a plastic container and it has like eight Band-Aids in it. Uh, and I bought that and I shoved that and the super glue into the, the first aid kit in the truck. Yeah, I know. I should have known better. I know. I know. So, and that, that's the trick with putting, you know, if you take loose Band-Aids and you stick them in anything... By the time you need one, they, they either are all twisted over or wrecked or, you know what I mean? You yeah. can't just put Band-Aids loose in something because they get yeah. screwed and, up. And that spot on your hand, it's like for the, the oh, yeah, Band-Aid using the, the gauze and the duct tape is kind of overkill. <laughs> yeah, in order, to, in order to close that off, I would have had to wrap my whole hand, you know, and, and it would have looked like I, like I grabbed a chainsaw or something. But, uh, yeah, I, had to, I put the freaking... Super glue on it. What's the difference between super glue and medical emergency room medical adhesive? Nothing. Fifty bucks. Fifty bucks. <laughs> um, I don't remember, Zach. I, you know, you had made me a custom kit one time that had a couple band aids in it, but I don't think this one does. Uh, which one is the, that? The combat it's got the kit XL adhesive. It's the enhanced. It's got the XL bandage, but not just regular band-aids. Yeah, no. Uh, Maybe that's something that we should add to the kit. <laughs> yeah, but here's the thing. Who wants to tear open their kit for a band-aid? Yeah, I know. That's, that's what the, the limit thing. kit's for. If you need something. Yeah, like, I don't want to tear the kit the open for a band-aid. Yeah. But you can if you want to. And again, You can have, if you want to. Uh, we I've, have a extra large adhesive bandage in the enhanced and in the combat. Oh, maybe you put band-aids in the, uh, the limit kit. I did not. You did not. I could though. You could, yeah. But anyway, people are, people don't need us. They don't need to buy band aids from us. They can just get band aids at the store. Um, what you get no, from that's us not, is stuff. You're not thinking the right way here. Okay. We, you got to read that. Uh, stop reading that freaking book and get your mind right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So anyway, that is my. Uh, that's the my my pain is 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 your is your benefit. You guys are going to benefit from my pain. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's 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 too bad, but yeah, sometimes these assisted openers assist a little too much, uh, and you got to be careful. 
you got to be careful with stuff like that. Uh, and I don't want to throw that company under the bus, but you just need to, you need to be aware of Check stuff like all that. of them. <laughs> yeah. You need to be aware of things like that. I would say that's not really company specific. Yeah. Well, actually that company, it kind of is uh, because that's the second knife from that company, different models. Like I have, uh, I have one model of knife from that company that I noticed that that was happening. So I stopped carrying it. And that was like a year ago. And then this uh, one came in the battle box and it's a different model of knife, but it's from that same company. And it did it to me also. And I'm like, okay, you should provide free consulting, give yeah. them advice. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're going to take my advice. <laughs> Not all right. It's time for me to be quiet and you guys to listen. So listen up freaks. Shop SOTG.com is the perfect place to go. If you are a student of the gun, whether you want to expand your brain, increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the pimp hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. Yes. All you right. Do. And we, we just talked about it, so I'm going to keep it short and simple. It is still Stop the Bleed Month, which is May. And over at ShopSOTG.com, our whole collection of medical gear is all on sale. So if you need to stop the bleed or if you're worried about gouging your hand open, get your butt over to ShopSOTG.com, get yourself a rapid tourniquet or one of the many lifesaver kits that we got. And uh, yeah, do that. ShopSOTG.com. There you go. That's where you should go. Uh, all right, so we've got a uh, student of the gun homeroom talking about uh, being dangerous on demand, and are we got enough time to jump into that, Jared? You want to get into it? We got about five, or you, or you want to wait ten minutes? Let's go ahead and jump into it. Okay. All right. Combat True hero. Yeah. Eli Dickin cleared of charges. Praised by police. Wow. Dude. All right. No charges will be filed. Is this what we're talking about right now? Yeah. Okay. No charges will be filed by against Elijah Dickin, the 23-year-old armed citizen who stopped a mass murderer at an Indiana mall earlier this year. So... You say, yeah, duh, I know. We already talked about that. It's old news, blah, blah, blah. Okay. The reason that I, I put this in here was because uh, recently uh, I was I was privy to a, a, a public forum conversation about combat accuracy and whether or not a gun, a concealed carry gun was too small or whether I mean from a compact size not a caliber size uh, to be accurate what is you know? combat accuracy right mm -hmm. exactly what is realistic now if you talk if you look if you try if uh, it, it's difficult to, to wade through or weed through all the garbage um, on the internet but if you listen to people about statistics Statistically, the average gunfight, I love this one, the average gunfight is three three shots and three yards and three seconds. Well, if you went by statistics, you'd never carry a gun. Yeah. You're like, if so you why are you even thinking about a gunfight? Yeah, you're like, well, the chances of you needing that are slim, so don't even do it. Uh, your house hasn't burned down yet, right? So why do you have a fire extinguisher? Yeah. Um, you know, you shouldn't, you don't need a fire extinguisher. Your house hasn't burned down. When's the last time your house burned down? It didn't. Oh, well, then why are you worrying with pot fire extinguishers? <laughs> uh, when's like, you know, why wear a seatbelt? You probably won't get an accident. You know, why carry a med kit? You probably won't get hurt. Uh, statistics, you know, uh, if I would have listened to statistics, you're like, well, you know, where I live, the annual snowfall, the average annual snowfall is 18 to 24 inches. Yeah, you got that in a month. Yeah, and actually, so maybe from, like uh, two from, days from January or from December to February, we got seventy-two inches of snow. <laughs> uh, so, so much for averages, right? Well, the reason I brought the uh, the uh, 
Elijah, uh, the Eli Dickin or the Greenwood Mall thing uh, is because in this story, it depend, depends on the story. You know, some of the stories, whether it's from CNN or whatever, they kind of gloss over. Or whatever. Um, but the NRA story, this is from America's First Freedom, which is NRA magazine. Uh, they actually got the police report and they re- reported on the details uh, remember, we were hypothesizing about what he was carrying. Yeah. Well, it was a Glock 19. Uh, and he took his first. Now, people said, oh, he fired 10 shots from 40 yards. No, he didn't. He heard the gunfire, drew his gun, told his girlfriend to get to the ground, went over, braced himself and used a trash can, I guess, for kind of concealment. Uh, yeah. And he fired four shots from 42 yards and he got two hits which is pretty darn good all right he got two hits he realized that he got two hits because the bad guy the murderer the monster reacted like whoa what was that i was gonna go slaughter these people and something just hit me so the bad and guy, the, he, he probably had no idea he'd been shot. He just knew that something was different. He's like, whack, whack. Whoa, what the hell? What's going on? So it, it, he realized, the bad guy realized, so he decided he was going to retreat and get, and, you know, move to cover. So this, this Eli Dickin kid, this guy was like 20 years old. My gosh. It, it's amazing. Good job, man. This is, this, you know, he's 22. He was 22. This freaking amazing the level of, prof- of professional performance by this guy. So rather than allowing or saying, well, I'm just going to hide behind cover and let the in. Well, I, I did my job. I'm just going to let this guy go. No, rather than allow this guy to, to get to cover and because he's still a threat, he's still carrying a rifle, right? So Dickin moves to close with the bad guy. So he fires his first four shots at 42 yards. Gets two hits, which I'm going to go, you know, that's pretty darn good. Uh, closes to 20 yards. Dude's still moving. He fires four additional shots. All of them score. Bad guy Zach, goes. We yeah. need a, we need some graphics to go with this, please. <laughs> uh we need you Maybe. to reincarnate this in a graphical form. Thanks. I appreciate it. Reincarnate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah you, uh, don't put Zach on the spot, but yeah, I mean, actually, that actually right now, but like that actually would be pretty cool, but um, yeah, just take this part of what actually happened. I'll have to, I'll have to do a whole nother video. So, um, so he moves to 20 yards, gets four shots. Now the guy goes down, but he's still struggling and he's still in control of his weapon. So Dickon realizes that the dude's he's still a threat. He's still in possession of a gun. He's still moving. So he closes even further, gets to 25 feet, puts two more pills in him, and he stops. Then an unarmed mall security guard ran up to Dickon. Hey, that's that's a ballsy guy right there, man. He was showing Dickon up. Dickon to told him what problem. happened. The guard uh, intercepted and briefed arriving officers. So when it comes to if if this guy, if if Eli Dickon would have listened to the experts about the average, he would have never. Well, yeah, the average gun fights three rounds in three seconds and three yards. So if, I, if you can hit a human silhouette at three yards, that's all you need, right? Because that's the average. But what if it's not the average? What if more is expected of you? And thank goodness for those the people, the innocent people whose lives were saved in this, uh, in this mall. We can, we can only imagine how many innocent lives were saved by the actions of this guy. And by the fact that this guy underwent training and he took his firearms handling seriously 
and he did this he performed as well or better than the average police officer would have could be expected to it's a good job oh uh, let's he, he performed way way better than an sro in a at a at a florida school let's pause real quick and welcome right. our guest in and then we'll continue all right welcome chris avina so the the primary purpose of our discussion uh is you say i'm not trying to tell you uh just because the average gunfight is you know close you know th within three yards or five yards or whatever i'm not trying to tell you to disregard that i'm not trying to say well look at the greenwood thing so you should spend all of your time shooting your pistol at 40 yards no what i'm saying is, is that we can't rely on statistics you know statistics say that you only need three uh or statistics say blah 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 well if that was the case we'd all just carry five shot j frames and that would be great why don't police officers all carry five shot j frames why do they carry glock 17s or sig 320s or whatever you know statistics say you only need three rounds and it'll be at three yards so why are you carrying all that extra ammo and well because mm -hmm. you don't know because everyone you know thinks who thinks they're gonna their gunfight is going to be average the it's when we examine statistics in, in you know in, in the in the cold hindsight of things that just you know that happened the person who's there when you're involved in it it doesn't feel average uh and you, you know it, it's yours and you have to be prepared and the you know the main thing i was trying to drive home is that you know, people say well what is combat accuracy and what is realistic and what should we you know be expected to accomplish uh or we should expect that we should be able to do to meet the challenge whatever that challenge happens to be now distance you know dave spaulding my friend dave spaulding uh years and years probably 20 plus years ago i was in a class of his and he said that that distance favors skill and and the the person who has the greatest amount of skill uh in in a distance situation or he said if you can get away or you know create distance and you have higher skill you're going to do better because let's face it and, you know uh, a retarded chimpanzee can pick up a gun and, and shoot you at two yards um gang i want to take do it quick, every day quick moment before we get too far to introduce we had a special guest pop in uh in the middle of the segment and uh rather than wait make him wait till we were done with this segment to uh to jump on with the interview for him i wanted to bring him in because he might have something to add and if not that's fine he can just sit there and wait but his name's chris avina he's publisher of american outdoor news and he's the host of the american outdoor news podcast um he's the uh on the board of directors for the dallas safari club northeast chapter he's been a lifelong outdoorsman so he's probably got something to add here well um <laughs> Every situation is different. You know, I grew up in a law enforcement family. It doesn't mean I'm proficient at uh, any particular yardage. Um, everyone has that comfortability factor, but there's going to come a point where we stretch our comfortability factor so, to suit any situation. Yeah, and thank you for joining us, Chris. I appreciate you being here. I, I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. All right, well, we'll go ahead and put it. We'll put the cap on this uh, on this segment um as uh, the the whole purpose of the student of the gun homeroom uh is to be dangerous on demand and are you able to be dangerous on demand yes or no uh and if if the bad guy is two feet away or if the bad guy is 20 feet away you say well you know something else that i'm gonna do this caveat and then we'll move on is people have said well if the person is x yards away then you can't shoot them because you can't go to court and say that you are in fear for your life right i've had people actually tell me well there's no point in practicing shooting distance because if they were 25 yards away then you can't go to court and swear that you are in fear for your life because they were too far away to hit you or whatever it wasn't a, it, in this case eli dickon wasn't in immediate jeopardy i mean he kind of was but the bad guy wasn't shooting at him the bad guy was shooting at other innocent people 
he used his weapon and his skill to stop a bad person because you know the definition of deadly force includes the preservation of not only your life but other innocent life and he was able to use his his weapon and his skill to preserve and protect other innocent life zach do we need to pause no, no we're okay. good all right so you know the idea that you know and and i've heard this you know I, i've heard this before, oh that, that distance shooting and you don't you don't need to do that because there's no way that you know if you shoot someone that's 40 yards away there's no way you can justify that you can't justify that in court that you were in fear for your life you know because if you're 40 yards away then you could just turn and run away and, and get away from them <laughs> well thank the lord that this 22 year old young man didn't take that kind of advice and run away you know uh, he did something he did something important and he saved people's lives so there you go there you go what is combat accuracy what's realistic you know should we rely on statistics no what you should do is you should you should improve your skill your your goal should be to never be satisfied and to be continuously working and continuously improving your skill uh and until that day that you are called upon so that is that mr that's that all right jared i'll let you take over and and uh ask our guests questions and and all that good stuff well, yeah the first thing i'm interested in is the uh just give people a little bit about your background i probably didn't do it very much uh, good service there. So tell tell us who you are, where you're from, and what you do. Well, my, again, my name's Chris Avina. I'm a New Yorker, born and bred. Not exactly the um, hot spot of the outdoors uh, as far as this country goes, but um, I grew up uh, an outdoorsman, um, camping, fishing, um, and it just became part of who I am. Uh, the magazine really came out of happenstance um friends talking about uh buying a publication i ended up just starting one from scratch because it was a lot uh, uh cost effective and uh here i am four or five years later just uh having a podcast loving the outdoors and uh hopefully bringing it to the next generation I don't hear that very much i just started a magazine out of happenstance <laughs> well, me and a friend were talking about buying a magazine from somebody, and the numbers that they were talking about were more emotional numbers. Uh, they weren't financial numbers. And I told him, I said, I don't need to buy your magazine. I could start one for a hell of a lot less. And he said, go ahead. And I said, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> That's my kind of people. I'd like to see you try. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, what did you just choose? American Outdoor News is the the name because that you're you're an outdoorsman and you've been doing this for a while. Uh, well, yeah, that's part of it. Uh, I consider myself a patriot, uh, so you know, I, I do. I did want it to uh, involve the American way. It's part of what our country was built on. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a patriot to you? I believe in the American way. I support our Constitution. I believe in our Bill of Rights. Um, I believe in freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, everything that's not in vogue today. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, I, I like history. Uh, I think every part of our history brought us to where we are today as a, as a culture. Um, you can't sanitize our history. You know, it's part of who we are, good, bad, or indifferent. Yep. Some people are trying to sanitize it. Exactly. And it's it's sad because when you when you remove the history rather than learning from it, that's really when you that what is the old adage? It's it's probably one of those cliches that's in the book Tyranny of Cliches, but it's like when you when you don't understand history, you're doomed to repeat it or whatever. History but, does repeat itself, and yeah. uh, we're on course to to see that happen. Yeah, it's interesting. So um, what would be your 
I would say top three, not favorite, but most interesting parts of American history that you would teach the next generation? Wow. Um, I think World War II is incredibly important. Um, you know, you ask a kid what, um, you know, what Pearl Harbor is, and they have no clue. Uh, you ask them uh, what D-Day is, and they look at you with a blank stare. Um, you know, some of the most important um, historical occurrences in our country's history. Uh, I think, you know, that should be taught. Um the American Revolution, and just as important, the Civil War, uh, 1862, was the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, there was uh, the first one. The first well, the no, the one. The second one. The second yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. The second one. <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're at a crossroad in our country's history, and, you know, we could very well have a Civil War in theory. Um Nobody likes to see that, but, you know, we need to learn from our mistakes. Look back at our history. Look back at what brought about the Civil War and uh, how could we avoid it? Yeah. So what kind of tell me about the podcast, American Outdoor, Outdoor News podcast. What kind of stuff do you talk about on there? You know, that's funny. I originally started the podcast across market, the magazine, and the podcast really just took on a, um, a life of its own. Um, I wanted to highlight, you know, some of my advertisers on the podcast, which I do. Um, it's broadened my talking points. I could get a little more political, uh, where I don't, you know, uh, take a political stance in the magazine. Um, you know, we speak to congressmen, we speak to law enforcement, we speak to military, um, which I, I think, uh, gives us a, a, a broader cross section of what we're really interested in and what people want to hear. Yeah. It's funny that you say that the podcast took a lot of life of its own because ours did the same thing. We started ours. We're on, this is 1,189 episode uh, for the public now. So we've probably got a little over 2000 episodes total. And uh, we started it. I think 2013 was when we started and it was, we didn't know what we were getting into. We we're just figuring out as we go. And and we started with a little tiny, um, I guess they call them interfaces, and it had two microphone inputs, and then we had a, a MacBook, and that was it. And, yep. and now we have a much bigger production than we had then, but you know, it's we just didn't know it was going to take on the life that it did, and it kind of became the primary driver for the business because we do training and, and we do... Uh, video and we do all kinds of different stuff, but you know, this podcast has given us an avenue to really resonate and, and speak directly to the listeners. Well, I'm actually going to be transitioning uh, the name of the podcast from American outdoor news to American outdoor Patriot. Uh, I want to separate the magazine and the podcast uh, and that, and the name also, um, gives us uh, a more diverse base to talk about American outdoor Patriot. That'll be the so, so same topic, same type of stuff, just different name. Yeah. Uh, you know, if somebody wants to come in and buy the magazine, I still have the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was an offer. He's like, Hey guys, you want to buy the magazine? Hey, if anybody's interested, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. Let them know. <laughs> Before we get too far away from the discussion of history, I, I've got a great example, a great modern example of people not knowing or understanding history. Uh, you guys, you, you know the TV show Bob's Burgers? Yeah. Well, the Bob's Burgers, just the, their last episode, uh, they, they were um, talking about this, this. They're going through the closet. And Linda finds this old wooden framed wooden box radio. And she's like, we need to get rid of this thing. And he goes, I can't get rid of that. That belonged to my, to my grandmother. And uh, he's like, and he goes, it's a family heirloom. So he tells a story and, and he says, it was the summer of 1942 and World War II was underway. And then they start talking about how his, his grandfather was um away he was a soldier and he was overseas i'm like Arr! 
Pump the brakes, Jack. People in Hollywood, writers in Hollywood, apparently, uh, if you ask me, in the summer of 1941, how many Americans were overseas fighting as soldiers? The answer would be that many. None. Zero. Zero. Pearl Harbor occurred in December of 1941. December of 1941. So the summer of 1941, there was a war in Europe, and the Japanese were acting up over on the other side of the world, but the United States of America wasn't involved in it. So, and the, the crazy thing is, I'm watching that, and I thought to myself, well, maybe his grandpa was Polish. No. <laughs> uh, Can we say that here? <laughs> yeah. Or, well, you know. <laughs> yep. Uh, I, I thought to myself, Probably 95% of the Bob's Burgers audience just accepted that and moved on. They're like, yep, that's exactly what was going on then. Nope, it wasn't because the people who are the writers for the show are probably all in their 30s or 40s and they have no understanding of actual dates and times. Yep. You know, um, so, <laughs> yeah, same thing at Animal just, House. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when the, when Germans the Germans bombed Pearl, Pearl Harbor, Harbor. <laughs> did we give up? Did we surrender? <laughs> He's rolling. Just let him go. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> the thing is, though, everybody that. in the audience got the joke. Yeah. It, it, today, if you showed that that clip to a group of millennials, they'd be like, "Yeah." So, <laughs> what did we do when the after the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? Nothing. Uh, let, let, let's take a, a giant step forward, and this goes years back, um, 9-11. Um, you know, uh, some years later, my son was in uh, in elementary school, and I had a teacher conference. I said, you know, it was on 9-11. I said, oh, by the way, I said, did you do something for 9-11? She said, yes, we had a moment of silence. I said, oh, that's good. I said, did the kids know why we were having a moment of silence? She said, no, you know, the kids, a lot of kids weren't born yet. And, uh, you know, they wouldn't understand. Well, teach them. <laughs> I said, well, I wasn't born during the Revolutionary War, but I think it was pretty damn important that I learned about that. You know, and and we say we'll never forget. But how many people really forgot about that? Oh, no, I, they've, they've, it's. They forgot a year after. But well, well, what were you doing when the Germans bombed the Twin Towers? <laughs> <laughs> when the when the Japanese bombed the Twin Towers in New York on nine eleven? Gosh, what were you doing? Yeah, yeah. but uh. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, you're you're absolutely right, and, and and that's that's why we do what we do. That's why we turn our microphones on every day uh, because. We're we're fighting an uphill battle, you know. We, you and I, and 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 the people on on our side who have microphones, we're fighting against literally thousands of people on the other side who don't have an appreciation for the Constitution, who think that rights come from the government, uh, who think that the word militia is a pejorative and it's a bad word, and and when you hear it, you should feel sad or angry or, or scared. Uh, you know, uh, who, who li literally believe that the president, the chief executive, the, the head of the executive branch of government has the constitutional authority to ban anything, <laughs> you, you know, or that, it, or that executive orders are the same as laws and that a governor or a president can sign an executive order and it's law. That's crazy, but we, we have people in our country that li that believe that, that do believe that it, that an executive order is just like a law, and you have to obey it. Knowing the history of why the the schooling system that we use here in America was adopted in Prussia, knowing that, I'm not surprised at all that people don't understand that that people are are doing things like not knowing what the foundation of this country is and what it means. And that it was so different than anything else. It still is. It's different than anything else, any other country that exists. 
we're the only ones that are a representative republic with a constitution that acknowledges that rights come from our creator and not from other humans. Because that's the only way that the humans cannot take our rights away. Well, I think kids today really um, disregard and completely disrespect uh, the men and women who fought for their right to protest or disagree or, um, you know, their right to assemble or, you know, be woke if they choose to be. Um, you know, people died for that right, and they're completely oblivious to it. Yeah, it, it it's it's a shame, but I, I believe that we're Zach or Jared, excuse me. Uh, last week we were trying to come up with the name of that test. Did you come up with the name of it? No, I totally spaced on that. Uh, did did you did you send Jeff a text? Did he ever ask? Yeah, he, yeah. He said he's gonna look it up, and then got distracted, and I forgot to follow up. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you both got distracted. You both need to yeah. take your ginkgo biloba. You gonna uh, go out on the street and ask questions? Yeah, no, no, Chris. You you might act, you might know about this. It's it's a a psychological test where they take you know any number of actors, whether they're twelve or fifteen actors, and they're all on the same script. And then they, you bring in one person who's not an actor, uh, and they, and the the the, uh, the the premise is is the person who's not an actor thinks that it's a focus group. He thinks that he's part of a public focus group, and they bring him into a room, they put him around a table, and they ask him questions, and they would do something as if they would hold up a piece of a uh, uh, paper, a yellow. It doesn't, you know, it could be immaterial. Uh, and, and or an apple, and they'd say, "What is this?" And the first actor says, "That's an orange." The second actor says, "That's an orange." And they go all the way around, and so the the one person who's not part of it, who's not privy, everyone in the room, he sees it. It's an apple. He knows what an apple is. He's known that since he was in kindergarten. Um, but everyone in the room says that's an orange, and so. I he think said, it's the ash conformity experiments. Okay. So he says it's an orange or you hold up a yellow piece of paper and say, what color is this? And the first person says it's blue. And everybody says blue, 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 blue. Until it gets to the, you know, the, the one non-actor and he doesn't want to go against the other 19 people in the room or 15 or 14 or whatever. Mm -hmm. So he says blue and but the and you say, well, that or for, first of all, that's psycho. So we can, yes. can you know, uh, but what they found was if they had two non-actors, if there were two non-actors, if one other person or it was an actor. So you bring you have 19 people plus one for 20 uh -huh. and you have one of the actors. You say, what is this? It's an orange. 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 And like number 12 says it's an apple. When it gets to the non-actor, 80% of the time, the non-actor would speak the truth. They're like, no, it's an apple. It only takes, in, and the discovery was it only took one other person to speak the truth, to get that person to have the courage, the mental mm -hmm. courage and fortitude to actually speak the truth. So, when, and the reason I brought that up and the reason we're discussing it is in our situation with our podcasts and with our, you know, our media outlets, we're fighting against a, a billion dollar machine. And the billion dollar machine, its job is to convince the American people that rights come from government. <laughs> its job is to convince the American people that the deprivation of rights can be reasonable. Its job is to convince the American people that the United States is a democracy and majority rules. Mm -hmm. And if the, if they can convince the majority to take away the rights of the minority, then the minority loses their rights. Well, that's it's exactly what, that's exactly what Nazi Germany did. Oh yeah. You know, they, they're like those, that's the minority. And so because they're the minority, they don't have rights. They're not people. We can do whatever we want. 
They controlled the media, they controlled the narrative, and they convinced people to think the way they wanted them to think. We're seeing it today. No, no, that was a long time ago, and that would never happen in America because <laughs> we have a constitution. <laughs> We're different. Yeah, we are. We are. But so, so I found the, the results here, mm-hmm. and it was 75% gave at least one incorrect answer if, uh, if the actors said the incorrect answer. And then when they had a presence of a true partner, which was the person after the after the wrong answers, the one person says the right answer, it ninety five percent of people were giving the correct answer. Only five percent would uh, continue to answer with the majority, which is a massive difference. And shame on those five percent. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's a huge change. So it just, they, they must just takes one of us. Yeah, no kidding. That's been general <laughs> Democrats. <clears throat> but that, what do you that's, think? Is it orange or an apple? <laughs> yeah, uh, a banana. <laughs> yeah, if it was me, I'd have said it's a banana. Um, <laughs> and they're like, what? You would have totally that's, screwed up their testing. <laughs> like, it's a banana. What? That's not part of that. It wasn't, it wasn't the question. No, it's too bad. Uh, but uh, no, that's why. People say that's why it's so important for us to turn these microphones on every week. That's why it's so important for us to continue to do what we do, to talk about history, to talk about, to reinforce actual fact. You know, and the, uh, the thing about, um, the outdoors, whether it's camping, fishing, hunting, hiking, whatever, is it's an attachment to, to realism. Are, are you familiar with John Sr. and his, and the return to realism? No, the, no. the professor from Kansas University, University of Kansas. Uh, essentially, he was, a, he was a professor who realized in the 1960s that the people of the United States were losing touch with reality or realism. That things were becoming notional. That people were more uh, they were more concerned about opinion and feeling than actually than reality. Uh, and th- he realized this in the 60s, <laughs> in the 70s. And so he, he, he created a program uh, at the University of Kansas where uh, he put people in and he put his students in a situation, situations where they had to appreciate reality. Uh, and that, you know, that's the great thing about, you know, Jared and I have been involved with in Zach too, uh, with the 4A shooting sports program. I was an instructor with the shooting sports program for 20 years. Wow. And that one of the when I and what I said 10, 15 years ago was one of the reasons why that's so important is because to a kid, you know, the shooting sports give a kid an opportunity to engage in realism. They give a kid the opportunity to engage in uh, some an activity that you know the when you're let's say archery, the target doesn't care about your feelings. The arrow doesn't care about your opinions. Uh, you're either going to strike the target because you did the physical things that you applied. You took what you were learned, what you were taught. Uh, you took what you learned, what you were taught, and you applied it physically. And the target, you know, bro- whether it's shotgun, the target breaks or whatever, uh, or it doesn't. It's reality. You know, I mean, it's physics and, and all that stuff, too. But you're teaching a kid, if you want to succeed, if you want the arrow to go into the center of the target, you have to listen to what you're being taught. You have to take what you're taught and apply that. You have to apply it consistently. And if you don't hit the target, if you didn't hit the bullseye with the arrow, it's not the arrow's fault, it's not the target's fault, it's not the bow's fault. It was you who didn't do the right thing. That is reality. You know, when kids sporting clays, kids love sporting clay because it's, it's, it's instant. You get an instant result. You know, they, they shoot in the target of the breaks or it doesn't, right? Yep. Uh, they don't have to go down. They don't have to wait five minutes or 10 minutes and go down range and check the holes or whatever. They know. They get that either instant gratification or they get the instant feedback that they didn't do it right. And if you want it to break, you have to do it right. You have to listen to you, but it's real. It's tangible. It's hands on. It's not notional. 
You know, uh, it's something that they can actually physically do. And, it, and it's and it's a tie to like fishing, you know, fishing or hunting. It's a tie to realism. It's a tie to the real world. You know, kids, kids who camp going out camp, you know, uh, and I, I can only imagine what it's like to take modern children camping for the first time. And. Uh, they're they're trying to find the Wi-Fi. They're standing next to an oak tree looking for a Wi-Fi password or something. Yep. I can only imagine. So many things to do in the outdoors that they have no clue about. So if people are brand new and they've just discovered you, what is the takeaway that you would like our audience to get from the American Outdoor News? Well, we like to uh, encourage people to get into the outdoors to uh, – our experiences that we share with them, whether, uh, you know, you're hiking the Appalachian Trail or um, fishing the Sea of Cortez or hunting the plains of Africa, you know, American Outdoors, uh, American Outdoor News has it covered. Uh, it's where your adventure begins. There you go. Yeah, we've been going, we're pushing up on two oh, hours. Yeah, let's... Uh... Wrap, go ahead and wrap it. Rippity wrap. So, Jared, I will let you do the rippity wrap. Cool. I have one more question before we rippity wrap, actually, and it'll be a quick one, hopefully. Uh, what? How did you come to be on the board of directors for Dallas Safari Club Northeast Chapter? Uh, well, I've been a, a DSC member for a while now, and, you know, I attend their uh, events and banquets Uh usually in Connecticut and um, you know, they know what I do and they just approach me and see if I wanted to be on the board, see if I can contribute and help them raise money, help bring awareness and things of that nature. Um, I've been on the communications board for a number of years now, and I'm going to be moving over to the political action side because um, I think we need more representation there. And uh, it's been it's been a great experience. Great group of guys, so all volunteer. And you know, if we don't do it and bring our traditions and uh, to to the next generation, it's just going to die on the vine. Yeah, that's agreed. So tell people where to go to find more about American Outdoor News. You could go to AmericanOutdoorNews dot com uh, for our next edition coming out in June. Uh, feature Hal Schaefer and talking about his new show, Renovation Hunters. Our April edition is still available on the website, uh, featuring Michael Wydell talking turkey hunting and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, and the podcast you could also get at the website or you could go to Waypoint TV or find us on Blueberry, Amazon, Apple, Stitcher. We're all over. <laughs> Any of the podcatchers. All the podcatchers. Pretty yeah. much. Pretty much. We're there. <laughs> cool. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to join us today, Chris. Yes. Thank you very much. Hey, I appreciate you having me on. It's been fun. All right, ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages, thank you very much for joining us for yet another episode of Student of the Gun Radio. We truly appreciate everyone out there. And uh, we will be back tomorrow, manana, with a, uh, with a bonus hour. And if you'd like to join us for the bonus hour, uh, you can go to getsotg.com. That's getsotg.com. Sign up for the bonus hour and be sure to join us. And remember, until we're together again, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. Thanks for staying until the end. Want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today? Head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like, rating, or review. It makes a big difference. Have a show topic submission? We would love to hear it. Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. And remember, you are a beginner once, a student for life.